Welcome everyone to this Montana Book Festival event, Writing the Body, a conversation with Chelsea B. Desitels and Joanna LFB Ryu. My name is China Reavers and I am a volunteer host for the Montana Book Festival. I wanna welcome you audience into this virtual space from Bozeman, Montana. The Montana Book Festival acknowledges that we are in the Aboriginal territories of the Salish Kootenai, Absaluke and, che and Cheyenne people. The Montana Book Festival strives and will continue to strive to help promote indigenous voices as one of the ways our organization acknowledges and respects the Aboriginal peoples of Bozeman and across Montana. For those of you zooming in from outside of Bozeman, I encourage you to take a look at the link that I'll put up shortly in the chat so you too know whose Aboriginal territories you're currently occupying. When I put it up, go ahead and let us know where you're zooming in from this afternoon. We're really excited to welcome Chelsea and Joanna to this year's virtual festival, but first I wanna take care of a little housekeeping. We'd like to welcome you as attendees to submit your questions to our authors via the Q&A at the bottom of your screen. Feel free to use the chat function to talk amongst yourselves while the event is taking place. On the back end, I will be monitoring both the Q&A and the chat for any logistical questions you may have throughout the event. The Montana Book Festival wishes to thank our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, Humanities Montana, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net. With that, I'd like to introduce you to our authors. Chelsea B. Desatels is a poet living in Minneapolis. Her debut poetry collection, A Dangerous Place, is forthcoming from Sarah Band Books in October 2021. Chelsea's work ap appears in Plowshares, Copper Nickel, Adroit Journal, Massachusetts Review, Willow Springs, Pleiades, Ninth Letter, and elsewhere. A Ten House Scholar, winner of the Jeffrey E. Smith Editor's Prize from the Missouri Review, and a National Poetry Series finalist, Chelsea earned her MFA from the University of Houston, where she was a recipient of the Imprint Verlaine Prize in Poetry and served as Poetry Editor of Gulf Coast. She has received support from the Anderson Center of Tower View, Vermont Studio Center, Minnesota Northwoods Writer Conference, Community of Writers, and others. Joanna Alefi Ryu is an assistant professor of English at Christopher Newport University, a contributing editor of Essay, a journal of nonfiction studies, and a faculty member at the Writing Workshops in Greece. Her essays, short stories, poems, and translations appear regularly in journals, including Bellingham Review, Cut Bank, Arts and Letters, and The Common. She currently serves as book review editor for the Journal of Modern Greek Studies and chair of the membership committee at the Modern Greek Studies Association. And with that, I'll leave it to our authors. Thank you so much, China, for those introductions. Thank you to the Montana Book Festival for generously hosting us. Thank you, Chelsea, for reading your beautiful poems with me today. And thank you to our audience members who are here to support and listen to us and I hope offer us some questions. I'm going to read from my new-ish book, This Way Back, which was published um, last year. It includes essays from several years, and I'm going to read the last one, um, the epilogue, which brings together a lot of the threads of the, um, of the other essays. Moonlight Elegy. In the village of Asgata, I used to run up in his mountains for an hour before dark. On days when the law prohibits hunters from shooting at the thrush and rabbits, I go out into the hills and run alone. Around and around itself, a mountain takes you, up to its spine, a ridge of dips and peaks. And you can see the other side, the city spreading out toward water. On moonlit nights, you can see the footprints of God scintillating on the sea. When I would return each evening, he would ask me, did you see the moon? as if anybody could miss the moon that showers light into a sky just turning navy. Dusk settles, but rocks and thorns remain visible in the growing dark. White light falls on my shoulders. The moon pencils sharp black shadows on the earth. Bats flap by, then vanish. 
I run at night because of the moon and I stay in the hills late because of the moon. I stare a little at the moon before rounding that last bend before the house. But I would always ask him where it was and he would point and I would crane my neck and look because the raising of his weakened arm was his gift. As a father ages, a daughter learns how badly he wants to go on as before, though his children aren't children and nothing is as before. When I lived in my parents' house here as a teenager, my mother and father used to tell me that my running made them worry. It's dark outside, the snakes don't sleep, hunting dogs stray, you could trip and fall and nobody would find you until morning. My father quoted lines from Seferis, our favorite poet. And now the new moons come up wrapped in the arms of the old moon with the beautiful island bleeding, the wounded, the calm, the strong island, the innocent. In cities, I can hardly see the sky. I live in an American city now and night is only night, black patches of sky, dark trees turned yellow in electric light. No one sees the stripe of the galaxy. No one sees stars. One night though, I was walking through a parking lot with friends and saw the moon between a hospital building and a school. Did you see the moon? I asked, then apologized. I don't mean to condescend, sound patronizing or say you didn't see. My father always asks me just that way. Seferis, a diplomat for Greece all through the Metaxas dictatorship, the Nazi occupation, and the devastating civil war that followed was a poet too. He wrote by night of old tragedy and new horror. He stayed in the British resort at Platres when my father was 16 and guerrilla warfare against the crown was starting. The nightingales won't let you sleep in Platres. What is Platres? Who knows this island? I lived my life hearing names for the first time, new lands, new madnesses of men or of the gods. My father carried letters, passed out pamphlets. Sefetis knew that independence would not bring peace. Soon after Cyprus became a state, another war tore the island open. A new solution has been imminent ever since. My father's home is wounded by politics and drought. Our village draws water from its own underground vein, which is shared among many farmers and therefore weak by day. My father waters the apple trees, jasmine and bougainvillea every night after sunset and every morning before dawn. He holds the hose over little moats around every tree and waits for each to fill. He forms a small sea around the roses, careful not to expose any roots. A hedge of rose laurel divides our land from the neighbors and bright pink flowers bloom across the way. When I return all pumped and sweaty from the hills, my father points to the moon just cresting over the horizon. It is red like blood. And I sometimes feel that he is pointing to a place of violence and torment that lives beyond our hills. When I run, I listen, half expecting to hear a wail, some sort of lament. The neighbor's rose bushes do not grow tall like ours. My father prunes the older leaves before they die, before the stunt, they stunt the growth of the bush. The dead understand only the language of flowers. On the trail of asphodels, hyacinths, and violets, we find our dead, the poet says. I ask my father how he learned to train the roses to bloom all year. From my mother, he says. I ask, and she from hers? No, he says. Yaya Agathi learned about the garden by watching it fail and grow day by day and year after year as a child learns to speak by listening. After asking, answering a question, my father walks around the house. He has worn the grass thin, one large circle, more like an earth-colored square scratched into the thirsty grass around the house. 
He stoops at odd moments to inspect the flowers, pluck some mint or lavender to rub between his fingers. My never, mother never gets his shirts quite clean on account of all the leaves left in his pockets. The violent sun has burnt blisters into the vulnerable skin on my father's head. He lost all his hair at 20, but rarely wears a hat. His cheeks are fallen, his face drawn back against the skull. Sadness and strength sapping medication have turned his eyes into upside down crescents, softened and still. When he smiles, his mouth bends into the shape of a half moon. When my father was just 20 something, he already had a family. And when he was still just 20 something, his first wife started dying slowly yet so fast. Family and friends told my dad to hope and pray and he did. Sentenced to remain alone among the living, my father lived. He married again. I grew up in New York while my father built up a school for Greek immigrants. In a photograph of my father holding a third baby, a son, his face shines circular and full. His smile faded after we, he brought us to the homeland, a grand adventure where the delight of doing this great patriotic thing waned fast. My father hadn't known what he would find when with his children still young and his wife happy in America, he moved us all across the ocean to his old home. He remembered honest people, slow baked tile roofs and houses built of stone. But we found sand and cinder block, fake wood and tin. His sisters in New York all said, stay here, Andrea. But my father said, my children have to know who they are. He wanted to build in Platres up in the highest mountains, away from all the bustle and the coast and dry plains where rivers gush and a garden won't dry up in drought. But he had to be practical. So he built a house in the low hills of his own village close to the city and to the sea. We went to school there, learned poetry and history and finished school. But the strain of impossible ideal damaged our united brightness. The moving brought suspicions and tears into the fabric of our family. And a few years into the adventure, he started to wear away that square of grass outside. He would call me out to listen to the poet, point to the ground where I would sit beside his folding chair under a pine with the thick scent of drying needles all around us. Few are the moonlit nights I've liked, his radio crackled. And we often lost the station, but my father would adjust the antenna so that we could catch the end. In Cyprus, you can't keep track of your own heart's mourning because there is your own loneliness, your pain, your family living somewhere else and breaking. And then there is your country, divided without defense or hope. Heart muscle tears like any other human thing. After years of perfect self-duplication, our cells can easily make a mistake. When our mother got cancer though, and our father got heart disease in that same sixth year of life in Cyprus, they did not consider human bodies and the inevitable, inexorable transience of our lives. They blamed the new home, the island destination of my father's choosing. They blamed the strain of a life so far away from where they'd started. On the night my mother came out of the doctor's office clean, her lymph nodes clear, the cancer gone, my father's voice shivered and his eyes flashed in the light of a street lamp, gleaning and wet. He said, thank God, these children have to have a mother. It was night. There was a moon. We drove home. Earlier that year, a silent heart attack had scalloped out a flap in my father's heart muscle, scar tissue that's loose and open like a bay. That little bay inside my father's heart might draw blood in and slow it down. Then it might clot. The little clot would travel up to my father's brain and kill him as it tried to squeeze through capillaries, thin as hair. He takes blood thinner and looks at his life waning like a moon. When he's scratched by a thorn, 
blood trickles down his arm or leg for hours. To live, my father needs to work, training vines to splintering trellises or planting bulbs for new flowers. He ties saplings to stakes and pulls up weeds and thistles from among the roses, always dodging the poisonous little caterpillars, which bite. Guardian of the garden now, unable to teach high school history any longer, my father plays teacher at home. Did you see the moon rise? Some nights the moon rises while my brother and mother and I are all done with running and with being outside. We sit, watch television, reading, grading papers, rinsing dishes. For years, my father tried to correct my mother's habit of missing moonrise, of missing everything there was to relish in the homeland. Dad always calls to my mother by name, Georgia, come see the moon. We love the inside of the house too much, he says, an air of resignation, almost sneering, but too tired for sneering, colors these calls to see the moonrise. My father has grown tired of his family's indifference to the moon, to the movement of stars, to the spectacle in the sky. So he's impatient, resigned to her nonplussed attitude, yet so eager to indict it and condemn her ingratitude, as if the Lord were hosting a party in our yard and this moonshine were his banquet. We won't appreciate the beauty of a young moon in an evening sky when it is as in tiny as an infant's fingernail, a puncture in the blue-black emptiness. Usually, he sits alone to watch it rising. We've already marveled at the milky band that straps around our sky, that band of stars that looks like a long, narrow cloud. We ignore the planets Venus and Mars with their distinct tremorless glow. We won't look at the covering, hovering constellations, the cross, the bear, but on the nights when we do at last answer his command, we sit outside with my father and we all talk together through the rising display. We look up or across to the horizon where he points. And for a dozen minutes, 15 maybe, we find something to discuss, politics, the prospect of rain or more heat, our relatives and friends. Each night brings a subtly new shade of glowing crimson. And then the sphere starts to look like hot iron or raw flesh open for surgery. I've never found the right words for the wonder of it. And if I think too hard, I feel fear. If one of us gasps, then my father looks glad. We have at last grasped the secret of the nighttime, this awful beauty. Thank you. Johanna, that was so beautiful. Um, I haven't um, heard you read that essay before. And so thank you. What a gift to start with that. Thank you um, to the Montana Book Festival, uh, to Joanna, to China. Um, I'm Chelsea, and I'm going to read from my book, A Dangerous Place, uh, which just came out on Tuesday, actually. So this is the first reading I've done where it is officially in the world, which is really exciting. Um, I'll read a few poems. I'm just going to read for about 10 minutes or so. I'm going to start with A Dangerous Place, which is the title poem from the book. It seems a beautiful spring, though I spend most of it indoors, watching through warped glass small tree buds burst into full green. The ice crystals on the edge of Lake Nokomis relaxing and spreading into waves lapping the bottom of bright canoes. And sometimes, near the shore, for the first time this year, a large white heron landing on spidery legs. An omen, I tell myself, a bird too smart to make a dangerous place its home. And I carry that with me to the hospital. And I think of the heron when the doctors say, congratulations, you're pregnant. Let's shine a light to greet your baby. And I think of the heron when they say, oh, sorry, it seems your womb is more cavern than nest and no, it's no baby at all. What have you been feeding this thing? And I think of the heron skimming the lake surface with spread wings, how could I not? As we watch on screen, the monster burst into 10,000 gray moths. And I hear the echo of wings in my belly. And I feel the fury of wings in my lungs. 
And when the doctors tuck a port above my breast, I think of the heron disguising a large bed in marshy grasses. And I imagine the white sheets as heron wings. And the whirring machines are white eggs. And the worried voices are sunlight on water. Um, the next poem I'll read is called Song of the House by the Lake. Um, I have a series of poems in this book um, that take after C.D. Wright's poem, Song of the Gourd. And this is one of them, so they're prose poems. In the north, I burned cedar, smoked out the ghosts, wrung my neck with baby teeth and rope. In the north, summer leaves turned early, yellow and oak red. My breasts swelled like gathering thunderheads. I scraped window panes, kicked on the heat, Ice fishermen drilled holes to what swam beneath in the north. My breasts swelled like snake bellies. Midwives said, use cabbage leaves. In the north, I went looking for mouths, found weeds instead. Doctors forked my knees, took a shovel and dug. In the north, I buried two birds wrapped in a rug. In the north, I couldn't hold what I birthed. I tore down backyard, retaining walls ain't unearthed beetles. Fake owls kept watch, canoes went unused, in the north something uninvited grew. I prayed to plastic bags, seeds sprouted heads. In the north, my body rearranged itself. I pulled deer ticks from the back of a thigh, swallowed soil and gravel. No one asked why in the north. There was no time to wean, no time to explain. My grief, the neighbor's broken weather vane. In the north, smoke rose from an empty fireplace. Out the window, winter blew. In the north, I willed my breast to withered stone fruits. Uh, the next poem is called Mythology. At first, it was easy to tell the story because it was actually happening right then. So we could tell each other the story of how a disease infiltrates a body but even then we did not recount all the parts, only the best ones, ending with how strong we were and graceful. But it started to get harder because you had to go back to work and I was still sick. So now it was just me and new people and most people don't wanna hear your story of grief unless they knew you before. See grief in a new person is ugly. But I kept practicing because I was hopeful that one day I might tell the part about that morning in bed. You remember, the lake was choppy and it was hot and raining, so we closed up the house. Remember, it was you and me and the baby in bed. She was hungry and I had to roll away. And then we were crying because we knew it was beyond the point, whether we were strong or graceful. And you were crying too. And in fact, I'm still trying to tell that story or at least write it down. But I end up talking instead about food and baby formula, and freezers of breast milk from strangers, and how to arrange the bags precisely so the milk doesn't sour. And of course, I always mention gratitude because people like that ending. And let's see. Um, this poem is called The Americans. It, it takes after the TV show, The Americans, if there are um, other viewers out there. The Americans. When you get home, I won't be wearing the wig I bought to hide my scalp. You'll have nothing to take off me. I'll meet you at the door. I'll want to ask how you know if you love someone enough. I'll want to ask what happens if all this time you mistook yourself for a real person. It's raining, come home. We'll watch the show where the husband and wife perform love by kissing passionately in the kitchen before leaving to spy for a secret country. It's about what we tell each other and what we don't. You won't say the trip was better without me. I won't tell you how I slinked around in a house coat carrying a teacup of dark tequila and the silence was a symphony blooming in every corner. Come home. I miss you. I've put away the wig, it's too brunette. It's just me here. I have no secret country. Um, this poem is called Covenant. 
One morning, all the nuns in the convent started meowing, mewing and purring until even the holy roof above them arched and curled, a feverish chorus slinking around the Christ figure's legs. Then it ended. The nuns gathered for dinner in silence. But the meowing had been unbearable to the townsmen. So they arrived with leather and horses and whipped the animal from each woman. And that's the thing about marriage. You take a vow, you give up your animal. After the diagnosis, it was a long time before we had sex again. First, there was the fear, then the pain and the fear. We settled into it, I suppose, my retreat, how I coiled tight my desire like the root ball I once found strangling a nugget of fool's gold. Not even the center of my longing was authentic. The problem with disease is that you have to keep asking yourself what's different now and what's not. It's a matter of survival. A plant alive in the wild tends its dark roots underground. One that's been dug up and brought inside though. That kind of plant has its roots teased and sliced so they'll go reaching for new soil. What am I afraid of? Okay, I'm gonna do two more. Um, this is called to my daughter in springtime. If you ever catch a mayfly by the kitchen sink, break its legs to pieces, feel a little glory in the killing though it was accidental. If you ever eat all the honey we bought to trap raccoons, lick the salt block on the tree stump, pull apart a green branch just to see what it looks like inside, if you ever stick a piece of trash in a prairie dog hole, curious whether the animal can still breathe down there or watch a trout squirm and kick on the creek gravel gasping, even if you unravel every thread of yarn in the bird nest I showed you yesterday, and even if the little blue eggs fall through their ruined home toward a concrete driveway covered in chalk rainbows, I want you to know none of us knows what to do with wonder. Not one of us knows how to love the world. Okay, and then I will finish um, with a poem called Maybe You Need to Write a Poem About Mercy. Um, it's after Robert Hass's great poem, Faint Music. Start this one with the woman standing at the edge of the woods or the desert, it doesn't matter. What matters is she's standing under a darkening sky and she knows at this point, having spent months in the hospital, that there is nothing she can do. No threshold between threat and tranquility, no demarcation she can draw around herself or her child for protection. Everything is actually everything else. The stone just kicked and whatever comes next are the same. And knowing this, a great emptiness swells inside her stomach, an airiness she could float away on. And the night bellows and the sun rings once more then slips under the horizon. Maybe then, a humming of an old tune, her own hand stroking her red hair, mercy. As in the story the man on the bus told me about his late wife, how by the end she'd forgotten their wedding even and their children's names, and once she went missing in the depths of winter, dead bent on saving the cattle from the blizzard that years ago left all the calves frozen on their sides. He told me his wife saw angels. It was her last day. She was at home and the nurse called him to the living room where the bed was. His wife asked, do you see them? And he said, yes. And together they counted the wings. When he told me this story, the man wasn't sad. He had just picked up groceries to make bread. He missed fresh bread, he said, and so he bought yeast and flour and fine kosher salt. He wanted to watch the dough rise. Because the man wasn't sad, I tried not to be sad too. He smiled and got off the bus. Out there, the street lamps flickered and the cold night grew and off he went to warm his kitchen. 
I waved and wondered if there's a word for the way joy and pain are the same. How, if we're lucky, they thread us like an electrical wire cuts a tree. And there we stand, tender and green, reaching, charged, humming. Thanks. Chelsea, those are so beautiful and so profound. They get at the things that we can't say. I especially love the poem where you narrate the way you narrate the story of, of having cancer and tell us that there are things that people get tired of hearing. And this is sort of a, a necessary part of our lives and a fact of relationships. And what I love and I feel so grateful to have literature and poetry for is that this is the place where we can tell strangers the intimate and deeper truths of our lives. So I want to ask in writing the body, in writing the suffering body, um, what are some things you, maybe you discovered or you discovered about the possibility? What is possible to say? Yeah, Joanna, thank you. Um, thank you for that question. I think it's so good and I'm really excited to be here talking with you about it. Um, I think the first thing I'd say is that um, this book came from a pregnancy caused cancer. So I was a few months into motherhood and then we found out that the pregnancy that had um, given me my daughter <laughs> had also caused cancer simultaneously. Um, so, so the first thing that happened is I was in this really strange space where um, literally, you know, the act of sex and pregnancy and marriage and all these things that had been life-giving and life-altering in like a really beautiful way um, had also become hyper dangerous and all at the same time. Um, so I think, you know, I went to poetry to try and figure out how to talk about that and trying to figure out even what my questions were about the experience, um, maybe not even reaching the answers, but trying to clarify what it is that um, was happening in my body, but also how that was going to alter um, my relationships with others, my relationship with myself, my relationships with nature. And um, so I think I discovered a few things and they're, they're worthwhile talking about within writing, but I think also just within life at the same time, which is that sort of like duality of, um, of grace and danger exist with, in our bodies in the same world, way that they exist out in the world. Um, and that was not something that I understood before I uh, began trying to write poems about that. And then I found that sort of um, those paradoxes or complexities that I was seeing in the world around me and in my relationships literally physically existed within my body at the same time. So I think the body can be a really wonderful place to start something like a poem or an essay because um, we get to ask those same really difficult questions in a tangible, physical manner. Um, and I think that can help ground a poem. And then we get to look up from it and sort of look around and ask bigger questions about what's going on around outside us. Um, so I hope that sort of starts to get at answering your question. But I think it was recognizing that that duality exists in the world and exists within me was one of the major discoveries that I'm still making as I go um, forward in writing about the body. Yeah. How about you? What is your experience writing, writing disease? I have the same experience that I, I think um, people who haven't maybe taken the plunge into creative writing don't know how little we know going in. And I continue even after so many years of writing and publishing, I still feel frustrated about how little I know while starting an essay. And yes, it's that, it's, it's the two together, the beauty and the horror that I also found myself able in writing to both express and sort of, it's only by writing it that I was able to wrap my mind around it. The things that maybe people don't also don't realize that we don't know the knowledge that's produced by our own poems. We don't know it until we've written it. And I actually, I wonder, we both just published our first books and I actually feel like 
I, I exist now. I feel like I know who I am because of the book. I feel like these are the things I feel and you can't just, you can't say, I don't really feel them because I've written it down. And I feel like I've proved and, and created myself in writing in ways that before I actually published the book, I didn't, and I dreamed about it, but I didn't quite anticipate how concrete the feeling of having produced my, produced my own self and my own ideas. Were you surprised at what you found? I feel like the, for me, the biggest joy of writing a poem is when a line comes and I'm like, oh, that is true. And I didn't know it or I knew it, but I hadn't ever articulate, like where there's that moment of discovery, right? And that's what we tell our students too, that that's the pleasure, um, but it really is. So do you, did you find surprises when the book came out about how your mind works or how you're reflected in the book? The surprises come, like you say, with the lines and I'm surprised that I'm not used to this, that used to how little control I have over it because it keeps happening and I keep getting frustrated. And I'm, yeah, surprised at what I discover in a lot of the essays I start, like this one started just with the moon. And actually my friend, my friend, um, Natalie Diaz, the poet is the one I said that to. And it's funny, like she wasn't famous when I wrote, when I published this essay and now she is. And I just, and she was like, you just start with this image of the moon. And I'm like, okay. And I didn't know that it would lead to this meditation on the body and the place. And I think writing the about focusing on the moon and just thinking she, she, Natalie Diaz gave me the prompt. She's like, okay, your dad and the moon, why do you connect those two? And so, and she, she was like, I'm going to check up on you tomorrow. You have to write this. And I, that's, I didn't know. All I know was my friend who was later to become one of America's greatest poets and neither, nobody knew that. Um, she, I was just like, discover that. And so and I think through making those connections between those really important sort of images, I discovered that I had a lot, I knew a lot about suffering and the body and land. Yeah, that makes total sense to me. I, um, whenever I'm asked about sort of writing practice, I say that the most important part of my writing practice, and this is true, is taking a walk almost daily through the same area. And I think it does two things. One, I'm there in my body, right? So I'm having a physical experience of what's happening, but then my mind is also thinking. And so what I end up with when I sit down to write is this like physical experience of something I saw often an image and wherever my mind went. I'm trying to figure out like how those two are related. Um, yeah, it seems like something super similar to what you're saying about essays. And you fill in the blanks. So giving yourself a, a sort of a task to fill in the blanks also helps. And the thing that I discovered while putting the essay collection, I thought um, that I had to, a book about um, writing about my Greek identity because I have a lot of history as was clear in this essay. I, I use a lot of history to try and understand the way I grew up with this idea that the Greeks are the best um, this is so important and like trying to understand the deeper history of sort of the middle, the way the Middle East and, and, and ancient Greek history all collide. And I thought that I was writing about my sexuality and desire in a, I thought they were separate books. And when I came to my dissertation defense, um, I was like hedging and I said, um, I'm sorry, these are two different books. I need to graduate on time. And I, I slammed them to one and as you probably guessed, my professor said, this is the most interesting thing about these books. It's the way you think about sexuality and Greekness and try and put them together in the same book. What, um, what are some ways in which putting together, because I want to know how you're putting the poems together. If Did you write any of the poems because you kind of had a gap in the book? I wrote one essay because I put them together in semi-chronological order and I ordered them and I didn't have a coming, like co coming to terms and reconciling myself with, with sexuality and Orthodox Christianity is such a big part of the book, but I didn't have the coming out scene written. So I was like, I need to write that. So I sat down and it's in a really different voice because it was, I'm done with the book. I just need to write this scene. And it just has a different, very sort of matter of fact and unexpected tone. Did you have any gaps in putting together the manuscript and you assigned yourself a poem? Yeah. Um, 
Yeah. First, I just want to say that I really relate to your experience of slamming books together. Like I started this book thinking what I was doing was just trying to capture the narrative of the disease just to like sort of have it and understand it. And I really thought that was the focus of the book. And I, that's obviously one of the major narrative threads, but I think the book is way more about like, how do we go on loving each other in spite of like all these unseen dangers? Um, so that was a discovery too. That was, that was wonderful to make. Um, I gave myself one assignment when I had the manuscript pretty ordered. Um, I thought I needed one more poem in a series. Most of the other poems were written at that point, and I was really tired of hearing my voice talk about my body. Like I just was like over it. I couldn't imagine readers wanted to hear that anymore. Like I didn't want to write. I just needed a break. Um, so I did write one um, sort of like song poem kind of in a different voice and meant it to sort of fill in a little bit of a, a gap in terms of um, just wanting to be free of all the narrative stuff, like all the sort of baggage. Part of the experience for me was wanting to like leave it all behind and not being able to. So I wanted to write a poem in which I sort of imagined that I could do that. Um, and it's honestly, it's like my least favorite poem in the whole book. I don't do well um, with assignments very often. And so that was a lesson for me, but I think, I think the manuscript needed it. Um, I wanna ask you a question about, um, we've talked a little bit about place and your essay that you read today is so evocative of the moon and the landscape. Um, and it reminds me of an earlier essay in the book too, um, in which you're burying your father. And so there's a description of body, but it moves and slips right into uh, Cyprus, right? And the, and this really detailed description. I mean, you can tell that this is a person who, where this land just flows, is part of you, right? And is part of your identity and um, the richness with which you describe the landscape is really just incredible and beautiful. And I'm really curious about whether, um, whether or how you find that slippage between the body and between land, both in writing, but then also maybe in a more broad um, perspective in the world. But I'm curious about that duality that I see in your writing. This, thank you for that question and for noticing that. This is one of those things that I, as a writer, didn't, one of many things, I didn't know about myself until I had it on the page. And actually it was really helpful reading your poems and noticing that you have a similar, you experience a similar slippage, you relate to landscape in a very similar way to me. And this is, is one of those sort of semi-universal things. I think, I thought that everybody loves like dirt and earth and the experience of like, I'm looking at my yard and like, I have, I live in a place that floods thank God, not as bad as Houston. Um, and I love like the sense of being able to like dig my ditch so that um, I feel like I'm safeguarding myself against flooding after the somewhat traumatic experiences we both had in Houston. I love that I can like get into my ditch and safeguard myself. I feel like tending anything that has to do basically with dirt and landscape is like taking care of myself. And it seems so obvious to me that I was telling a friend of mine and they're like, no, that's not how I feel. So I discovered this by about myself through writing, through just naturally finding myself interweaving, like get a tree, being inside of a tree. Like I thought it was normal to like climb a spin to a tree and like get carobs down. And like, I thought we all have these peasant fantasies and we all like Marx talks about alienation from our labor. And I was like, yeah, that's all of us. We all long to be farmers. Right. <laughs> and so I discovered that's not true of everybody. And I, but I discovered that it is, there is maybe something, and this is how maybe writing becomes universal in that there's some, if I go further down into the, the depth of my experience, I can find something that is common to all of us, which is at some level, we're aware of our mortality and our physicality and the way the body that makes us, gives us our sense of who we are, um, is vulnerable and will ultimately be become part of the earth again. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I, as you were talking, I was thinking about how, so we met in Houston, which is home for neither of us. Um, and since then have both relocated to places that I think really feel like home for us. Is that true? Yeah. Um, and so I'm thinking about whether place was that important to me before I started writing or whether writing has made it more important. And I think it's probably a forever thing, right? Like I, I grew up in the Black Hills um, and I could call to mind right now like precise hillsides and rocks and exactly what shape that boulder is at that part of the creek. Like I, it's, you know, it's just part of my brain at this point. Um, and so it makes sense to me too, that as we're writing the body, this like sort of physical thing that the other physical things that are available to our imagination easily are things that we go to and that they're related to one another. I loved reading your allusions to Houston flooding and the ominousness of it. And you're reminding yourself, don't worry, it's just a minor flood. So we're probably not going to be totally underwater. And we both have this sort of, I think I'm, I was reading in your work, what I also felt that Houston was quite foreign to both of us. We were glad to be there because we both um, met so many important people. We, it was part of our education, but also it became like a symbol of something really important, which is like Houston for everybody listening, like whatever you think Houston symbolizes in your mind, it, it did to me at least while being there, like the oil and the industry and the sort of using the earth, mining out an indifference to landscape and a focus on sort of a utilitarian relationship to the land is very much in the more like the cultural atmosphere. So I think it became a symbol necessarily to us of the more sinister aspects of industrialization. And that brings us back to back around to your initial response to the question about um, cancer and how pregnancy, which is this source of life also brought with it something sinister. Um, and if we weren't for industrialization and modern medicine, like statistically speaking, we would have like died as infants. So industry, this is kind of the cliche of progress, a cliche of progress, but we don't really understand it until we get into the intricacies of how the cliche about progress being a blessing and a curse kind of plays out in our real lives. Yeah, that's reminding me of my experience often of beauty in Houston. Um, I was surprised, I mean, I had imagined it as a concrete jungle, right? So when I got there and found beauty so many places, I was really struck by it, but I was also really unnerved, if I'm being honest, because so much of the green beauty in Houston is so hyper manicured, right? It feels like there's no wildness there or the wildness that exists there wasn't natural. It was like a man-made wildness. Like it was very unnerving to me um, trying to figure out how to make sense of this sort of like new beauty. And I think it goes to exactly what you were saying that this, it had sort of this sinister underlying, right? It was like so unknown to me too. Um, yeah, really interesting. And it was, I think, impossible to the audience. We had several wonderful conversations in Houston, but it's like we couldn't talk about this until we left. We couldn't articulate it until we were safe from Houston. Of course, nobody's safe from what Houston symbolizes. Um, and um, we're eager to hear your questions. Um, and maybe if um, China has any of her own, so it doesn't look like we have any questions from the attendees yet. There's still time if anyone wants to submit them to the Q&A. Um, I myself have just really been enjoying this. There's been such rich conversation and I'm thoroughly looking forward to watching it again when we repost it on YouTube, um, just because everything is beautiful. Um, one quick question I have is, well, either of you be releasing your books as audiobooks and will you be recording them yourselves? Because I absolutely love the way that you have read your essays and your poems and it brings another dimension to your work, I think. And um, 
I've just started listening to poetry audiobooks. And so I'm wondering, will we be seeing that from either of you? <laughs> I can say that unfortunately, I don't think there are plans for an audiobook, but I agree with you. Um, hearing a poem is a whole different experience and embodiment of it. And I wish that like audio poetry books were a regular thing. Like I wish I could go for my walks and just plug my headphones in and, and listen. Similarly, I haven't been offered the opportunity yet, but I would definitely love the opportunity because yeah, and I would totally, I heard that like, especially with prose, like book is kind of thick. It really wears on your voice, but I would, I would do what it takes. I would figure it out. I believe that you have what it takes to make it happen. So um, one thing that I really, and I think Joanna, you kind of brought this up in your first question to Chelsea. Chelsea, in the, I believe this was in the first one you read where you mentioned um, that you don't talk about grief with someone new. Like it's only something you share with people you know because no one wants to meet grief with someone new. But these are your debuts. <laughs> so you're, you're introducing yourselves with grief. And I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on that, if there's any hesitation. Um, and what do you think the reaction will be if, if you have any anticipation? Oh, I love making people cry at readings. I tell my, like, I, I, I've never, I've heard Chelsea read a couple of times and I haven't heard her make those apologies. I don't understand when, po I think poets do it a lot because they have a chance to inter like interrupt their reading and say like, this is a dark one. This is impressive. And they apologize. Uh-uh. I think that's what literature is for. I think that literature is the place um, where, and it's almost like, I think if you open a book, you've consented to sort of be moved. And whereas in, um, at the grocery store or in sort of polite conversation, I think there's a level of intimacy, like, and, and dealing with our own sort of difficulties that we're not prepared for. But I think if not in literature, then where? And I have the privilege of teaching in a college classroom and I urge students to recognize, like be honest with themselves about like, you go through reading something painful, you cry. I was like, we want, sorry, I'm really passionate about this. <laughs> sorry if I go on too long, but like we need to sort of use, I'm offering up in a way, I'm offering up my grief, I'm offering my grief to others to help them cry about their own losses. Like we need to grieve. Again, I'm extremely passionate about this. The need to grieve is enormous. And if we don't, that's when the problems, in my opinion, that's when the real problems start. So yeah, we need to cry. Yeah, and there's a lot okay. of here, shared grief and shared grieving um, because it just forms those connections and reminds us all of the humanness of what we're going through. But yeah, and sorry, Chelsea, I think you're gonna, you had something to say as well. Oh, no, I just, I am 100% behind you, Joey, and I feel like um, when, you know, when I'm, I was writing that poem in a new place, right? And trying to think about like, am I allowed to tell my new friends like what I am in the middle of? Or is that like a super weird thing to talk to? Um, but that's why I wrote a book instead, right? Because um, it was a place for me to grieve and to put it out there. But yeah, I mean, we come to the page to have um, empathy and to have experiences. And um, I will say, though, now that the book is out, um, a few wonderful family members have read it and a couple of close friends have read it, none of whom are writers. And I have gotten many times like, wow, that's like, that's really, there's some really heavy stuff in there. <laughs> And that's true, there is, but there are like moments of lightness and beauty too, I promise. Um, but yeah, it just makes me giggle because that's something I've been hearing the last few days. Can I say one more thing about writing grief and writing um, disaster and writing sadness? I My definition of trauma is a potentially traumatic event that doesn't find a relational home. Okay, I got it from some psychologist but from my in, from my personal experience and the like seven articles that I've read it th something we become traumatized when we don't have a relational home and when we don't connect 
about the the loss or and that's what I believe I mentioned in the essay that I read my father's early traumatic loss and I believe that especially men um when they lose when they have a loss they're not they're there's a demand especially in Anglo-American culture but also just most masculinities don't offer space to grieve and my belief is that we're traumatized in so far, again, my personal experience, we're traumatized in so far as we have not found a home or a person to hold our distress or grief with us. No, I think that's very true and very, and something beautiful to share and also to remember as we deal with so much in our lives. Um, and we do have a question from Lisa and this is also about grief. She said, thinking about grief and public mourning, has the pandemic changed your writing habits? Has it changed what you are writing? I can answer that um, quickly. I, yeah, I think the combination of having sort of the first book finalized and then being in the middle of a pandemic um, my, my work feels quieter. I think there was a real urgency when I was writing the poems in this first book. Um, I didn't quite know if, if I was safe. I didn't feel safe. I felt, um, it felt really important to sort of try to express what was going on. And so there, there was almost sort of like this violent urge to get these poems out. And now, you know, I'm five years down the road from that experience. Um, I, I have written a lot more in those five years. And so I think um, the combination of that and then being in the middle of this sort of sometimes slow paced time has led to more, um, the work maybe has more contemplation or um, a little more perspective to it maybe. I'm writing in form, I'm writing sonnets more than I ever have before. Um, some of that is just because I'm also uh, you know, we're all at home. And so I can only get about eight lines of a poem down before there's an interruption. So it's like a good time to make a turn when I come back to it. Um, but yeah, I think that I think the poems are quieter. And I think they're reaching more for community and for beauty. Um, we is coming up in a lot more of the poems, we our, you know, sort of a more communal experience. Um, and that's very different than many of the poems in the first book. Yeah, Joanna, how about you? Yeah, um, Chelsea and I had three sort of things converging, the same things. We moved to a place where we felt around the same time, we moved to a place where we felt more at home. We published a book and we had the pandemic. So it's hard to discern for me, which is the causal factor, but I'm writing less about Greece and Cyprus um, and more like my first essay that I've published um, since the pandemic, uh, published two and Greece and Cyprus doesn't come up at all, which I had never even imagined doing before, but it's a combination of not having been there for three, two and a half years and being in a place where I actually feel safer. That's a, an irony of our sort of like how unsafe I felt in Cyprus. I mean, sorry, in Houston, I feel safer in the pandemic now, like even in the height of it, I felt connected because I feel at home in the landscape where I am than I felt pre-pandemic in Houston, in spite of wonderful friends and, and mentors like Chelsea. Um, so I'm not writing about Greece and Cyprus at the moment, and I plan to, but I'm sort of writing about Virginia. Well, that's awesome to hear. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I don't think we have any more questions. There have been a lot of comments about how wonderful this has been um, to hear from both of you to listen to your readings. I'm thoroughly excited to see what else is in both of your um, works. So if there's no more thoughts, I will wrap this up, but any last, let's see, thank you. <laughs> I'm like trying to, we, we mentioned this earlier before, I was like, oh, you can be distracted by things. I just got distracted. <laughs> but um, yes, I would like to thank both of you again. Thank you to Joanna Alethe Ryu and <laughs> Chelsea V. Desitels. And thank you to everyone watching and participating. You've been a great audience. Thank you also to our event sponsors, Arts Missoula, Humanities Montana, the Dennis and Phyllis Washington Foundation, Whitefish Review, and MissoulaEvents.net. 
Just a reminder, you can purchase books by these authors. I threw the links up in the chat, so please make sure you click on those. Um, and many of our other Montana Book Festival authors at Fact and Fiction Books, be sure to enter the code MBF when you check out on their website, factandfictionbooks.com, or you can vocally say the code MBF if you're buying books in store. I also urge you to purchase Montana Book Festival merchandise at montanabookfestival.com. There you can also donate so we can continue programming after the festival this year. Thank you again, everyone. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Thank you. Thank you, Joanna. Thank you, Montana Book Festival. Thank you, China. <laughs> Thank you. Thank us. you so much. Thank you.